Um, so it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Marielle Smith today. So Marielle is a postdoc with me. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background about her. Um, so she did her uh, undergrad at uh, Cardiff University in uh, Wales. Uh, she did not learn Welsh, um, finished that in 2005, went on to the Imperial College of London, got a master's in 2006 in science communication. Um, and so then she went on to actually do a PhD at the University of Arizona from 2010 to 2016, uh, where I met her. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I did want to say in that interim between 2006 and 2010, let's see, it's a long list, but Marielle studied uh, the loss of frogs in Costa Rica, uh, actually quite a high profile project there on that, um, went on to uh, do conservation biology of the Mauritius kestrel in Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, um, produced a science radio pro program in Fairbanks, Alaska uh, on ener energy and energy saving. Um, I imagine you also did a lot of backcountry adventuring in Alaska at the same time. So anyways, uh, that was an active four years before starting her uh, PhD. Um, so anyways, I met her at the University of Arizona because we actually overlapped in labs, so we were both advised by Scott and Seleska there. Um, it was my great pleasure as a senior student to work with Mariella. She came in with interest in uh, LiDAR remote sensing, so that was something I was really spearheading in the lab, and so I was able to, to contribute to, to, to her experience there. Um, and so in addition to learning all the regular stuff that entails to be an uh, ecology and evolution student at the University of Arizona, uh, Marielle developed um, great computing skills while she was there to analyze this LiDAR data, great field experience in the Amazon forest, um, including picking, picking up a whole lot of Portuguese. Um, and so uh, and we were uh, lucky enough to spend time together in Brazil there and, and work on LiDAR and, and just research generally throughout. So when I started my position here, it was very shortly um, that I found myself wondering if I could convince Marielle to come continue all the work that we had going on and take it to the next level and, and do new and exciting things as my postdoc. And so I was overjoyed that she, she was able to, or that she decided to accept. I still feel like it's quite a coup for the lab. So again, my great pleasure, um, uh, Dr. Mary Smith. Thank you so much for that. Lovely introduction. <laughs> Scott, do you mind just closing that door? Sorry. Oh, right. I said I was going to do that when I did do it. <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to share my research with you here today, and I'm really excited to have meetings with um, departmental faculty and students um, tomorrow. And if you didn't get a meeting, then um, please shoot me an email and we can set something up. So, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about responses of tropical forest canopy structure and function to high temperatures and drought. Um, the goal of my research is to understand how forest canopy structure and function responds to seasonal and interannual variations in climate. So here we have some um, environmental variations, say changes in temperature and or precipitation. That's going to result in some change in the canopy structure, um, which I'll explain what I mean by that later, but ch some change in the forest and um, that will result in some change in forest function. In this case, um, some change in the carbon storage of that forest. So um, why do I care about tropical forests? Well, as you probably realize, tropical forests are hugely biodiverse, and they also store huge amounts of carbon. And that's kind of where my research focuses on, is the carbon. Um, this graph, just to give you some idea, shows you the amount of carbon stored in, above and below ground in tropical forests in that blue bar. And I'm comparing that to carbon that's been released from anthropogenic sources since 1751. Uh, we expect that tropical forests will get um, warmer, you can see temperature going up there, as well as drier, so lower precipitation in uh, the coming century, and we're already seeing some of the effects of that. Um, and tropical forest loss would result in a, a very large increase to the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, just imagine if all of that was to disappear and there would be significant feedbacks, we think, to global climate. And yet, um, the future of tropical forests and the carbon stored within them is highly uncertain, with some models projecting that those forests might actually increase in the amount of carbon they can store, 
whereas other models um, project complete dieback of the Amazon forest in some of the most dire projections um, in response to climate change. So we clearly need a better understanding of how tropical forests might respond to climate change and specifically how they might respond to temperatures and droughts. So this is the, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about here today. Um, the first part of the talk, I'll address how um, tropical forest photosynthesis might respond to high temperatures. The second part, I'll look at how tropical forests um, might respond to um, and are responding to water shortages, shortages sorry, um, specifically seasonal dry periods and anomalous droughts. And finally, I'm going to present to you um, forthcoming work that I'm about to get started on putting together a ground-based LIDAR database for ecosystem and biodiversity modeling. So firstly, um, how will tropical forest photosynthesis respond to high temperatures? This is work um, that I did as part of my PhD at the University of Arizona, studying with Travis Huxman and Scott Salaska. As many of you are probably aware, there have been quite a few drought experiments in the Amazon, um, and yet tropical forest warming experiments on any large scale um, are lacking. And as I've uh, shown you in the introduction, we really need to know how tropical forests will respond to climate change. Um, and there's just you know, a lot of uncertainty about the physiological mechanisms involved. With respect to temperature, there are two prominent hypotheses in the literature about how tropical forests um, and photosynthesis specifically um, will respond to high temperatures. The first is that um, tropical forest photosynthesis will decline at high temperatures um, because photosynthesis is directly negatively affected by high temperatures. So this involves negative impacts to the biochemistry of photosynthetic carbon fixation. For example, in this 2008 paper by um, Chris Dowdy and Michael Gordon, they found that in a tropical evergreen forest um, in, the, in the Brazilian Amazon, uh, net carbon exchange, um, NEE on the y-axis here, um, declined precipitously about 28 degrees Celsius. Um, and so they concluded that um, this was evidence that tropical forests are currently at a temperature threshold, mm -hmm. and any further increases um, will have negative impacts to these tropical forests. Alternatively, high temperature declines in photosynthesis um, might be due to concurrent um, increases in vapor pressure deficit, or VPD. And so I should explain that um, VPD is the difference between the amount of moisture in the air and the amount of the moisture the air can hold when it's saturated. So it kind of gives us um, a sense of how um, water stressed atmospherically um, plants are, with um, high values of VPD indicating high levels of um, water stress. Um, so as we can see here, VPD and temperature are strong covariates. And in this indirect pathway, as temperature increases, VPD also increases. And that causes leaves to close their stomata in order to prevent water loss. So that's what's being shown here, um, increase in VPD or, or water stress. And um, leaves close their stomata, so there's a decrease in stomatal conductance. Um, indeed, modeling work by Lloyd and Farquhar, also in 2008, found that declines in photosynthesis at high temperatures were almost entirely due to um, stomatal closures, which, as I explained, occur when there's um, an increase in vapor pressure deficit, rather than direct temperature effects. And they concluded, we find no evidence for tropical forests currently existing dangerously close to their optimum temperature range. Um, as you can see, because VPD and temperature are so close, uh, highly correlated, it's really difficult to distinguish these two different mechanisms in natural settings. But it is critical to identify um, which one of these mechanisms is um, kind of dominating. And I should say they're not mutually exclusive. Both of them are, are probably happening. But um, if direct effects are dominating, then um, that kind of... Uh, it, it, it implies that um, you know, there's just a, a loss of photosynthetic efficient. Uh, you can't continue to photosynthesize. There's, there's nothing you can do. Whereas if um, there's evidence for indirect effects, then that does um, infer some sort of continued function um, under some climate change scenarios, which I'll kind of get into. 
to, so to test whether tropical forest photosynthesis is, um, uh, is being affected more by one or the other at high temperatures, we really need to find a way to decouple vapor pressure deficit and temperature. And conveniently, we have this great tool uh, called Biosphere 2 Tropical Forest. Um, it's a tropical forest mesocosm owned by the University of Arizona and operated by the university um, in Tucson, if I didn't say that. Um, maximum temperatures in B2 are about 10 degrees Celsius higher than lowland Amazonian sites, making it the tropical, tro uh, hottest tropical forest in the world. Go figure, you know, tropical forest in a greenhouse. Um, and so uh, in this facility, it provides a controlled environment where we can reduce the strength of the correlation between VPD and temperature. It's not a full decoupling, but it's a partial decoupling. And we can do that through small rainfall events and humidifiers that maintain relative humidity across a range of temperatures. So uh, that's, that's what it looks like. I'll just explain in a sec. Um, I'll show you where the sites are um, in a couple of slides time, but this is just to show you that, um, the relationships between vapor pressure deficit and temperature at the different sites. I'll use the same colors in all of the plots in this part of the talk, with B2 in red, three evergreen tropical forests in the Amazon in blue, and a um, tropical dry forest in green. And so here we have VPD on the y-axis. Remember, higher numbers are higher water stress, temperature on the x-axis. And so um, what you can see is that in the natural forest sites in green and blue, VPD increases rapidly with temperature. However, in Biosphere 2, the red line, VPD increases more gradually such that for a given temperature, um, VPD is lower in Biosphere 2 than in natural tropical forest sites. Um, so just to run through our hypotheses quickly, um, we just saw the kind of data version of this uh, cartoon um, uh, here with VPD and temperature. Um, and the natural forest sites would be the blue line, B2 would be the red line, where VPD increases more gradually with temperature. And so if uh, direct effects, the first hypothesis is uh, you know, the thing that's uh, predominantly driving down photosynthesis at high temperatures, um, then we would expect the response of photosynthesis and temperature to basically be the same at both natural and uh, natural forest sites and B2, right? Because B2 doesn't get any kind of advantage from you know, having a lower VPD. However, uh, if the second hypothesis of indirect temperature effects that's these VPD-induced stomatal closures is what's dominating the response. Then we would expect um, a forest with lower VPD, like Biosphere 2, to continue to photosynthesize up to higher temperatures. So uh, these are the sites. Um, Biosphere 2, as I said, is in Tucson, Arizona. Um, Tesopaco is a tropical dry forest in Mexico. And then the three evergreen tropical forest sites in the Amazon. So for this study, we analyzed ecosystem carbon exchange data from eddy covariance towers in the natural forest sites and from a tower in Biosphere 2, which estimates net ecosystem exchange by measuring CO2 concentrations, changing CO2 concentrations. OK, so what do we see? Um, just to remind you, Biosphere 2 is in red. Uh, Tesopaco, the top tropical dry forest, is in green. Uh, Amazon forest sites in blue. And we're looking at GEP, which is gross ecosystem productivity, uh, or you can think about this as being total forest photosynthesis and temperature on the x-axis. Well, the natural forest sites in blue and green decline at about 28 degrees Celsius, whereas um, Biosphere 2 continues up to crazy high temperatures. <laughs> so what we see is that Biosphere 2 is less sensitive to temperature than natural forest sites. But um, amazingly, it has almost exactly the same response uh, to VPD as natural forest sites. So this is evidence for that second hypothesis that VPD is the major um, factor driving down high, uh, high temperature declines in photosynthesis. Um, OK, so you might be thinking this is just some idiosyncrasy to do with uh, biosphere 2 that's not to do with VPD and temperature. So we wanted to check um, whether VPD indeed limits um, high temperature photosynthesis in, at high temperatures in the real world, in the, in the natural sites. 
The answer appears to be yes, and I'm just going to show you how we did that. So there's a lot of information on what I'm about to show you, but don't get too bogged down. I'm just showing it to you for the method. Um, so to, we basically did an analytical decoupling of VPD and temperature um, for the natural forest sites. And so we examined the independent effects of temperature and VPD on GEP or photosynthesis by performing separate regressions between GEP and temperature, um, binning by VPD, these are all separate B VPD bins. And then we did um, you know, independent regressions between uh, separate regressions for GEP and VPD binning by temperature. And so we combined all of that um, by plotting the distributions of those slope values that I just showed you. Um, but we only um, used data equal to and above 28 degrees Celsius because we're just interested in the high temperature response. Um, so what you're looking at here is um, the blue shows you GEP sensitivity to VPD and the red distribution show you the slope values or the sensitivity of GEP to temperature. The dashed lines show the mean slope values and where you see the asterisks, those are where the mean slope values are significantly different from the zero line where there would be no effect, right? So what do we see? Um, well, across all of the plots, looking at the VPD, the effect of VPD on GEP, that's the blue distributions. Uh, so all of them are significantly different from zero and it's a negative effect. Whereas temperature um, has a positive effect or no effect on GEP. So we conclude that VPD is also the major control on GEP at high temperatures at not natural forest sites. So everything I've shown you is um, in support of the second hypothesis that um, photosynthesis uh, uh, seems to be under indirect temperature control. And that when VPD remains low, so there's lower water stress, GEP can continue up to higher temperatures. The implications are that tropical forests are not uh, currently at a high temperature threshold, and they may be able to withstand quite you know, considerable temperature increases. However, the big caveat is that um, the mechanism isn't, we need more information on whether the mechanism um, could actually happen. Namely, um, plant water stress under high temperatures might be mitigated with increased water use efficiency with increased atmospheric CO2. Um, but there's uh, papers uh, that support this, like this um, paper led by Abigail Swan that found that increased CO2 levels reduced plant water stress under drought conditions. However, this phase study uh, led by Sharon Gray showed, um, you know, I provided evidence against um, this water use efficiency idea, showing that the benefits of high CO2 concentrations on photosynthesis diminished as drought intensified. So jury's still out, but I think it's kind of exciting that, you know, there is this potential for continued function under high temperatures. Okay, so next part of the story. And um, so in this part, I'm going to be addressing how tropical forest canopy structure responds to seasonal dry periods and anomalous droughts. This is work that I started as part of my PhD, um, as I said, uh, working with Scott Selesko and Travis Huxman, and I'm um, uh, completing with um, Scott here at MSU. So first question is, is there phenology in tropical evergreen forests? Well, I should explain phenology is the timing of seasonal events that occur in the life cycles of plants and animals. Um, and uh, if we look at these four pictures um, from a phenocam in the central Amazon, two in the dry season, two in the wet season, um, yeah, it's not very obvious, is it? It's certainly not as obvious as if we walked out into a tropical, uh, sorry, temperate deciduous forest here, you can see the seasonality very clearly. Um, and in fact, this question is very hotly debated. Um, but there is growing consensus that many processes important to forest function um, exhibit phenological patterns. So we're seeing seasonality of ecosystem fluxes, seasonal patterns um, very strongly in terms of litter fall and leaf flush, as well as woody growth. And it seems likely that much of tropical uh, forest phenology depends on dry season length and intensity. 
One aspect of forest function that has strong seasonality is gross primary productivity, or GPP, um, total forest photosynthesis. Uh, so GPP is on the y-axis here, that's photosynthesis again, and months of the year on the x. This is um, data for, and model projections also for a site in the um, Brazilian Amazon. It's an evergreen tropical forest. And uh, so observations from eddy flux towers show that in the dry season, this gray region here, uh, we, there's an increase in photosynthesis in the dry season. However, all these colored lines are the model projections, and you can see that they don't really match up. In fact, uh, the models project a decrease in photosynthesis in the dry season. So that discrepancy indicates that we don't have a proper understanding of the mechanisms controlling forest phenology. This is especially important to understand because we expect seasonality of these systems to change. Uh, specifically, dry seasons are expected to get longer and more intense. In addition to which, um, you know, it's really important for us to understand how forests respond more generally to drought. So there is a number of hypotheses that could explain this increase I showed you in the previous slide, increase in um, GPP or photosynthesis during the dry season. Firstly, it could be purely driven by environmental changes, changes in light, and indeed it is lighter, in, uh, more light in the dry season, there's fewer clouds. Changes in light quality, so changes in diffuse versus direct um, radiation, um, or changes in soil water and precipitation. And in fact, this is what ecosystem models mostly assume that is driving um, the, the seasonality of GPP. Um, rather than, they, they don't assume, few, I should say, models assume any change to the biology of the, the forest canopy. However, um, recent research um, in which both I, Scott and I played a role has shown the importance of leaf quality in determining seasonal patterns of ecosystem fluxes. And so uh, what this paper by, um, led by Jin Wu and Lauren Albert showed is that there's quite significant changes in the composition of leaf ages in the forest canopy through the year. Um, so I'm not going to fully explain this figure, but uh, basically there's an increase in mature leaves in the dry season. And as it turns out, mature leaves have higher photosynthetic rates than young or old leaves. And so it's this combination of leaf age dependent physiology and leaf age demography or the composition of uh, leaf ages in the forest that ch lead to changes in leaf quality. And that appears to um, be a really big um, uh, factor uh, leading to changes in uh, ecosystem, uh, seasonality of ecosystem fluxes. On the other hand, these studies found that changes in leaf quantity uh, were not nearly as important in determining the seasonality of GPP. And so I'm just going to explain uh, quickly, leaf area index, or LAI, is uh, the total one-sided area of leaf tissue per unit ground surface area. So you can kind of think of, that, of it as being the total forest leaf area. Um, so they didn't find quant uh, leaf quantity as being uh, so important as changes in leaf quality. However, the study, these studies just focus on total LAI, which um, if you just take a look up here, that's the total LAI line there. Um, you can see it doesn't really change much through the whole year. Um, so it would make sense that that doesn't really explain the change in ecosystem uh, fluxes. However, um, what about vertical distribution of LAI? Could that be an important factor determining the seasonality of ecosystem fluxes? And that's what I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on. That's my question. So just to get the end of that question, there is evidence already from this paper by Tang and Dubai in 2017 that um, vertical distribution of LAI does change seasonally. And I'll explain that research in a sec. But firstly, I just am going to explain what I mean by vertical distribution of LAI or leaf area index. So we can have our forest, and we can calculate um, the, um, the leaf area for this forest, and that would just be one value, and that would be the total LAI. Or we can divide the canopy up into, say, two levels, or you know, we could do this for every meter height in the canopy. But in this case, we'll just do it for two levels, and we'll just uh, you know, calculate the leaf area for the upper canopy and the leaf area for the lower canopy. So that's what I mean by vertical 
um, distribution of LAI. This paper by Tang and Tobias used spaceborne LIDAR. Um, I'm going to be talking about LIDAR a lot, so I'll just explain what I mean by that. It stands for light detection and ranging, and it uses, LIDAR instruments use a laser to map the distribution and quantity of, um, in our case, uh, uh, forest vegetation. Spaceborne LIDAR has a very large footprint, about 65 meters, which is quite different from the instrument that I'm going to show you that I used. Um, it's uh, much more highly uh, temp spatially resolved. Um, but in this paper, they looked at uh, the uh, seasonal dynamics of the upper and lower canopies. Um, and uh, this, so these plots show you three periods during a year. Um, and it's for the whole Amazon basin, so it's a very large study. Um, and what they found is that uh, the green area here shows you that the upper canopy was increasing in leaf area in the first part of the dry season. In the next part of the dry season, the upper canopy lost leaf area. Now let's look at the lower canopy dynamics, which incidentally, I should explain, they call the understory. So just store that away and see whether you think that's a, a, a appropriate terminology by the end of the talk. Anyway, the upper canopy was losing leaf area at the latter part of the dry season, whereas the um, lower canopy, or what they call understory, was um, increasing in leaf area, which is intriguing. And indeed, uh, when they plotted a regression between the two canopy levels, they were strongly anti-correlated. And so they concluded that this could be due to light limitation of the upper canopy on the lower canopy. And so the way that this would work is that if the um, upper canopy you know, dies, back, dies back, loses leaf area, um, then that would release the lower canopy from light competition and it would increase in leaf area. Before this work was published, we were already working on a study to investigate the seasonality of vertical canopy structure. Our data set of monthly ground-based LIDAR measurements uh, allows us to look at canopy structure um, in a more uh, finer, higher, sorry, higher spatially resolved way, as well as temporal, um, te higher temporal resolution also. So we can look at more, a more detailed look at the seasonality of vertical canopy structure. And in addition, we're going to compare um, the seasonal responses to drought responses. So here are the research questions and hypotheses for this study. Firstly, we wanted to understand how does vertical canopy structure change seasonally and in response to drought. And we were interested to see whether we would find um, similar dynamics that Tang and Dubaya found with the upper and lower canopies exhibiting um, distinct phenologies. We wanted to understand what the structural mechanisms are of these um, vertical changes. And we came up with two hypotheses um, that might be um, responsible, although not mutually ex exclusive. Firstly, seasonality might be best determined by biological factors associated with vegetation height. And that might indicate uh, some role of hydraulics and rooting depths in terms of um, different responses of high and low vegetation. Um, alternatively, seasonality might be best determined by canopy environment. And by canopy environment, I mean um, the uh, environmental conditions experienced by leaves in a given area. So predominantly, that's going to be light availability, but also associated with that is going to be VPD and temperature conditions. And finally, we wanted to um, explore what are the environmental drivers of those um, changes. So I've broken these up into three different kind of types of environmental drivers. Um, seasonal environmental, we looked at precipitation, radiation, and vapor pressure deficit. And what I'm calling intrinsic environmental is getting at the influence of the upper canopy on the lower canopy. Um, so it's kind of testing that light um, limitation hypothesis. In addition, we um, included a phenological um, parameter, day length, which has often been um, uh, shown to be highly correlated with uh, leaf phenology studies. And uh, so that would kind of indicate that the canopy might be responding to some kind of um, yeah, biological clock rather than environmental variables per se.
So as I explained, I used a ground-based um, LiDAR instrument to measure vertical canopy structure. Um, so you can see that's the um, instrument there, a little silver box. Um, and this instrument gives us a two-dimensional vertical slice through the forest that we can use to analyze aspects of forest structure. Here's um, an example of the data here with canopy height on the y-axis and distance along the transect on the x. The colors show you the leaf area density in that location, and that is the um, area of leaves in a given volume in the canopy, where high values, so sort of here, show you high leaf area densities, um, and low values show where there's, um, the density of leaves is not so great. So we can put all of that data together, kind of aggregate it into this, what we call a leaf area profile. Um, and the way we generate that is just, it's the mean of the leaf area densities at each height. So for this forest, um, the Tapajos that I'm about to explain, that was a study site, uh, most of the leaf area is um, in the lower part of the canopy, um, lower canopy heights, that's kind of bottom heavy. Uh, so the, the study site is the Kilometer 67 site in the Tapajos National Forest in Brazil, um, near to Santarém. We have about four years of monthly LIDAR measurements, um, fortunately including the recent El Nino year. And so that enables us to um, compare the seasonality in these baseline or non-El Nino years um, with the 2015-16 uh, El Nino year. This site normally experiences five months of dry season, um, but there is normally rain during the dry season. However, in this El Nino year, um, it was seven months long, so it's a two months extension, and there was almost no rain at all. Um, I was walking through the forest and the leaves were crispy, which is really unusual for this site. Um, each LIDAR measurement uh, means measuring each one of these four one kilometer long transects, so four kilometers worth of data uh, each month. So firstly, let's address this first hypothesis that seasonality might be best determined by vegetation height. And this is kind of doing, uh, taking a similar approach as the Tang and Dubai paper, where we just divide the canopy up into upper and lower levels um, and look at the dynamics um, for those upper and lower levels. And if we do that, it looks like that. Um, but we're obviously going to use the full leaf area density data. And OK, so first results. Uh, so to acquaint you with these um, graphs, we've got total LAI on the top, um, the seasonal pattern. Um, and then these are the panels for upper and lower canopy uh, leaf area index. I'm showing you on the y-axis LAI scale by the mean. For, and it's, so it's scaled by the mean for each year um, to uh, avoid any, um, so we make sure we're not looking at any interannual variability. Um, the strong red line is the uh, El Nino response, and that's one year's worth of data. And the, the line here and the blue line here and the black line shows you the non-El Nino, or what I'm calling baseline, um, year's worth of data, and that's three years. Um, okay, so firstly, you can see that the dynamics within the canopy for the upper and lower levels, um, it, it's much more dynamic seasonally than what's going on with total LAI, which we kind of knew from previous studies. Um, in fact, we find very similarly to the Tang Dubai result that the upper and lower canopy levels are very highly correlated. Um, so per perhaps, again, indicating this light limitation of the upper canopy on the lower canopy. If we look at the uh, El Nino response, um, it's generally doing the same thing as um, baseline years, but a um, much more pronounced um, response. OK, so now let's look at the seasonal response through the whole vertical profile. This first um, plot is the initial profile, so just showing leaf area density through the, um, through the whole canopy. And this is an average of um, the, all of the years. Um, for the uh, middle of the dry season. So this is kind of the starting point for the time series. Um, these plots show you the, um, the difference in the vertical profiles for each of those periods. So, um, for example, these lines show you the difference um, in the profiles from the middle to the end of the dry season. 
And um, as before, the strong red line is the El Nino response, and the other colors are the non-El Nino years. So this is just another way of looking at the time series I showed you in the pre previous slide, um, but this time you know, that we're seeing fewer time points and um, it's uh, fully vertically resolved. Well, what do we see? Well, um, in the first period, in the, um, the second part of the dry season, there's an increase in the upper canopy and a decrease in the lower canopy. And at the onset of the wet season, there's a reversal of those patterns. And um, the other thing to note is, as we saw in the previous time series, um, the El Nino response is similar but more pronounced. Uh, we compared the uh, seasonal patterns of, uh, that we get from LIDAR with the seasonality of canopy greenness, or EVI, which is Enhanced Vegetation Index. And it's a metric of photosynthetic activity that's used in um, a lot of um, phenological um, studies. Um, and interestingly, we see best co correspondence with the upper canopy, where um, there's an increase in EVI in the second part of the dry season that agrees with this increase, um, decrease in EVI at the first part of the wet season, which again agrees here with the upper canopy response, and then not much happening in the last period. Um, Okay, so next let's look at um, the second hypothesis that seasonality might be best determined by um, canopy environment. And remember, by that I'm meaning just the, the environmental conditions experienced by leaves in, in any given location. So to do this, um, we divided the canopy up into four layers of approximately equal leaf area index. Um, and each layer is um, defined by a different distance from the top of the canopy. So if you take this data and you do that with it, break it into four layers, that's what it looks like. Um, the first layer is um, the layer at the very, very top of the canopy, wherever you are in height. Um, so it might be a bit difficult to see from the back, but there's a top layer there, there's a top layer there, and then layer four is the deepest layer um, in this kind of dark maroon color. So you can see that this might be a better way of looking at canopy changes, because if you're a leaf here, or a group of leaves here, that might be quite different, and sorry, you're in the understory in layer four, that might be quite different from being a leaf at the surface, um, similar height, but um, you're, yeah, you're right at the surface, so presumably getting a lot of light. And yet, in the previous analysis, we just lumped all of those lower canopy leaves together. Um, so now we're, we're looking at these individual kind of environmental zones. So here's the analysis I showed you before. We've seen that um, before, but um, now we've broken that, just the El Nino response, so just the red lines I've chosen, because otherwise it gets way too confusing. Um, and we've broken those up into these four distinct layers. Um, it's still a lot to take in, so let's just focus on the uh, first period, which is uh, basically considered to be the dry season El Nino response. Um, but we see similar patterns in baseline years also. Um, so this red line here, which shows you the total profile um, response or difference for that period in the dry season, is now this black line here. And I've just smoothed it a bit more to make it easier to see. Um, so again, that uh, black line is the total difference in the profile. And then you've got four lines for the four different layers in the canopy, with the layer one being the surface layer and layer four being the deepest layer. And when we break the profile result down into these individual layers of different distances away from the canopy surface, we see the upper canopy leaf area increases in all of the layers. Whereas um, there are the lower canopy shows divergent responses with um, the leaf area being lost at the canopy surface in layer one and leaf, leaf area being uh, gained in the deepest layer, layer four. Uh, so this is really interesting once we actually broke the canopy into these four layers because now we see that the decrease in the lower canopy, in that black line, um, is driven by loss of leaves at the canopy surface. And so much of the low canopy is not the understory, but in fact surface of leaves of smaller trees. Um, rather, this is the understory. 
So these are all kind of small trees in, you know, in gaps, basically. Next, we wanted to identify key environmental drivers of seasonal leaf area index changes. So we conducted exhaustive uh, linear model searches and calculated the relative importance of predictors across all models. As I explained earlier, um, we looked at VPD, radiation, and precipitation as the environmental drivers, so predictors in the model. And we also included day lengths um, as potentially as an indicator that the dynamics are under phenological control. We also included upper canopy LAI as a predictor for lower canopy LAI. So I'm about to show you a lot of data, but I will talk you through it. Um, this column is for the first anal analysis, where we just broke the canopy up into those two different levels. Um, and in each of these little plots, um, the predictors are shown here. The length of the bars shows you the relative importance of each predictor across all of the models. And um, this shows you what's being predicted. And then in this column, this is um, the results from the second way of breaking up the canopy into these four individual layers. With, um, and, but I only included the surface layer, layer one, and the deepest layer, layer four, um, in the analysis. Um, so for the upper canopy here, we've just got a surface layer. And now I've been able to break the lower canopy up into the surface layer and the deepest layer. OK, so let's summarize what we found. Um, so day lengths was, um, very interestingly, the most important predictor of upper canopy LAI, both when you look at the whole of the upper canopy um, and when you just look at the surface layer. So much more important than any of the environmental variables, which is really interesting. Um, and upper canopy LAI was the most important predictor of lower canopy LAI, both when you look at lower canopy altogether or when you break it into surface layer of the lower canopy and deepest layer of the lower canopy. However, um, that's uh, not quite as simple as it seems because the direction of the relationship between the upper and lower canopy is opposite for the surface versus the deepest layers. So I'll just show you that in the next slide to clarify. And we found this across the time series, but I'm just going to show it to you on the profile, because you've already seen this, and I don't want to introduce more material. Um, but yes, as I said, upper canopy LAI was anti-correlated with the surface layer. So as you saw before, upper canopy leaf area increases, lower uh, canopy surface um, decreases in the low canopy. Um, and yet, uh, upper canopy LAI is positively correlated to LAI of the deepest layer. So, Upper canopy increase here, deepest layer increase here. So uh, I find this super interesting because I think it suggests that the low canopy is not always light limited by the upper canopy because um, the low canopy, if you're in the deepest layer, can increase at the same time as the upper canopy is increasing. So rather, I think this suggests, although I'm still thinking it through, that water availability might be a more important factor than light availability in the lower canopy. Um, since leaf area increases in the deep shade zone there um, and uh, uh, decre uh, decreases in the high light zone there. So to conclude, um, we wanted to know how vertical canopy structure changes seasonally. And we found, uh, like Tang and Dubai, that um, it is vertically structured with upper and lower canopies showing divergent responses. However, intriguingly, we found that this, um, the upper and lower canopies, that uh, anti-correlation may not be causal, specifically because we found evidence that the lower canopy may not be controlled by light limitation of the upper canopy. We looked at the structural mechanisms of the vertical changes and found that um, the low canopy dynamics are often driven by leaves at the canopy surface, not the understory. Um, although I should point out that this is quite a gappy forest. Uh, it's got quite a high disturbance rate, and so you know, this might not be the case for all forests um, across the Amazon. We observed consistent responses across canopy environments, um, across canopy environment layers in the upper canopy, but divergent responses in the low canopy. And so we conclude that vegetation height um, is more important for taller vegetation, 
while canopy environment might be more important for shorter vegetation. And uh, thinking about this, uh, I think this may be because canopy environments um, at the top of the canopy may be more consistent, they just consistently highlight, whereas perhaps there's more um, variety in terms of canopy environments in the lower canopy, where you can be in a uh, highlight in a gap, or you can be kind of in the understory. We looked at the environmental drivers of these seasonal changes and found that the best predictor of upper canopy seasonality is day length, uh, indicating that um, it might be controlled by an internal biological clock rather than responding to seasonal changes in environmental variables per se. And then um, still, I think this lower canopy result is intriguing, but still a little confusing. Um, have, and and when maybe we just need more kind of uh, plant level physiology measurements to, to tease it out, but it does maybe indicate that it might be controlled more by water availability and demand. So um, we asked, does, seasonal, uh, does the seasonal response of canopy structure predict its response to anomalous drought? And we found that they are very similar, but the response to El Nino tends to be um, more, more amplified. Although um, everything I've shown you here is really the short-term response, and to get at the longer-term demographic effects, we need interannual LIDAR surveys and um, tree inventories, which we have, and so I'm excited to do that next. Um, but just to point out that LIDAR alone cannot distinguish um, the mechanisms of leaf area changes. So any um, loss in leaf area in this profile could be due to leaves being lost or branches because we can't distinguish those two. Or it could be tree mortality and increase could be due to leaf flush, tree growth or recruitment. However, I think it's safe to say that on um, shorter seasonal timescales, we're probably predominantly looking at leaf loss and leaf flush but during the El Nino, trees really might have died, so that would be interesting to look at the tree inventory data. Um, lots of implications and lots of further questions, as I've indicated. Um, what are the implications for uh, future structure of the forest? Um, predominantly, I'm thinking in terms of droughts. You know, we saw loss of leaf area in smaller trees at the canopy surface, so does that mean that those guys are, are toast and large trees and understory trees might be less vulnerable? Um, what's controlling these responses? Perhaps some combination of height, light, evaporative demand, rooting depths. Um, would love to get into that more. Um, I think it would be great to incorporate vertical changes in canopy structure to ecosystem models and see how that affects our predictions of seasonality of GPP. And um, yeah, lots of implications for remote sensing measurements. Given that um, our upper canopy seasonality best agreed with EVI seasonality, presumably that means, as we, I guess we knew before, uh, satellites are predominantly capturing the upper part of the canopy, but they really, this indicates that they're missing quite large dynamics um, in the lower canopy. So I don't have time to go through that. Um, just real quick, this is a new project we're starting to form a ground-based LIDAR database collaboration um, with uh, lots of Brazilian collaborators on here, uh, institutions. And we already have, I'm very excited to say, a lot of the data from our collaborators and it spans a really large area of the um, uh, Amazon basin, um, including a variety of different forest types, water regimes, and land use histories. So uh, this is going to give us a really excellent resource to understand how vegetation structure and function vary over environmental gradients. Um, we've got, um, at many of these sites, other um, data in, as well, like tree inventory data, environmental data, camera trap data at one of them. And um, so we can do a multi-site analysis of forest structure, um, including areas where there is no airborne LIDAR data. But where the data sets do overlap, then um, we can provide validation for airborne and spaceborne LIDAR. So I think I'm kind of out of time to go over that, um, but I can explain more if you have any questions. And I'd just like to thank these funding agencies and partner institutions. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, 
And yeah, thanks, and I hope uh, we'll see you guys at the next handover. And Mary, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll turn it over to you to get questions. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Yeah, so you're totally right. We are not sampling the upper levels of the canopy um, as thoroughly as we are the lower canopy. So um, especially with the seasonal um, study, that was something that we were quite worried about, that that could actually uh, be a potential artifact um, uh, giving us the results that we're seeing here, but without being a real biological um, phenomenon. So um, yeah, so we... Uh, so Scott actually helped to write a function which um, tries to test that by um, making sure that we, um, uh, we resample the data, making sure that um, each height in the canopy is sampled equally um, across the time series. And actually running that, um, we found no change at all between the resampled data set that kind of corrects for that bi potential bias and um, between the, the, the regular uh, data set non-corrected, if that makes sense. Um, so, sorry. I was just add, there's the one part is that there's a transform the way you apply to the data comes from the curve reform. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, probably should have started with that, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, do you want to kind of on that? Yeah, so basically we do take care of that by, um, it effectively ends up kind of adding leaf area at the top um, because we undersample it, um, yeah. So, and we, we're quantifying all the time sort of the amount of bias that we have. Um, but the, the good thing about the ground-based LiDAR data is that um, in comparison to the aircraft, um, we just have like so many more pulses like per column that we, you know, we certainly are sampling the upper canopy um, more than often the aircraft LiDAR is sampling the, the, the ground. So, um, so that's a positive. <laughs> can, you can you say that again? Um, it's, uh, it doesn't, it's just two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. Oh. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Um, going way back to like early in the talk, you show that the, uh, the dominant trees in the overstory at Atkins put their leaves on right when they dry, and they have high productivity because they all have mature leaves. So, I don't know, so not, just to they start, they initiate earlier than that, but they have a sort of a peak in terms of young productive leaves at that period of time, right? Um, so just to clarify, like it's a bit complicated because those figures that I showed with the changes in, in leaf age composition um, are often based on measurements of the upper canopy, but, but then people also kind of, people aren't really focused on different le levels in the canopy generally, like that's why our work is quite different. So sure. it tends to be like a forest level dynamic is what I'm getting at rather than specifically for the upper oh, canopy okay. level. So yeah, but you're right. Like, so, so, so the young leaves um, uh, tend to flush right at the beginning of the dry season, uh, we think, and then it takes a while for them to mature. And so then they have high photosynthetic rates by the time they've reached maturity. Okay. But I'm not sure that totally answered so, your question. So maybe so you could. So like, uh, I'll assume that the trees in the are going to charge. Right, right. And that's what most people do assume, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, and that explains what you're seeing in the understory. Mm -hmm. which suggests to me that the dry season is actually a great time to be out there photosynthesizing, and that there's actually too much water, not enough, in many areas in the Amazon during the wet season. And just, I have experience in, in an entire one square mile of the Amazonian mm -hmm. rainforest in southwestern Venezuela, and that's very much the case. There's like Bona and Coquinga forest all over the place. They have too much water at times. Huh. Yeah. And uh, probably lower productivity during the wet season mm -hmm. than during the dry season. Overall, if you consider the Sierra Firme and the Virginia Yeah, that's what super interesting. That? I feel like I could answer it a number of different ways. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, wait, yeah. where is I going to start? Oh, yeah. Sorry, so, no, no, it's really interesting. Um, so, one place to start is that 
yeah, we don't think this forest is water limited in the dry season. So I think you're quite right. It's potentially light limited. You know, we think that the trees, the big trees especially, have deep roots. You know, it seems like they have, except maybe on El Nino year, it seems generally they have enough water to really crank during the dry season and make the most of that increased light. Um, and interestingly, it sits right on the threshold um, in terms of annual precipitation. It's 2,000 millimeters per year. And there's been a couple of papers showing uh, which forests are light versus water limited. And it tends to be like that's the threshold, 2,000 millimeters. If you get um, that and above, then you tend to be light limited. If you get below 2,000 millimeters, you tend to be like water limited. So it's a really interesting site for that reason. And so, yeah. Hmm, where else to go? <laughs> what about, oh, what about that oh yeah, and so we want to, that's the other place I was going to go. So we want to, um, so most people have been kind of focusing on these terra firme forests, and there's, um, I think, a really under-researched area, it turns out, is um, sort of um, seasonally flooded areas. And so, you know, maybe those uh, might do better with climate change, you know? Who knows? Like, we, yeah. So we want to look at this. Yeah, it's like, is it 30%? Yeah, so it's estimated like around 30% of the Amazon is in uh, seasonally waterlogged or a seasonal anoxia. Mm -hmm. So we want to really like add to that kind of like how, we want to add to the environmental variability across which we're monitoring these responses. Yeah, we have, a, there's like this great um, group of folks in at um, IMPA, the, the Center for Amazonian Research in Manaus that actually Oh, wait. North South extension, that, that's oriented specifically to get a gradient of forest across water logging things. This is one of our collaborators' PhDs, was 600 kilometers <laughs> in the Amazon. That is hardcore. Makes me feel a little. <laughs> hey. Yeah, thank you. I had a question about um, you sort of, because it's wider, you kind of lump all just like the leaves distributed in. Right. Do you have any sense of like, are you talking about species difference? And I know it's super diverse, but like species differences versus are these sort of kind of the sameish genuses at least, and different sizes or what? Um, so okay, not not in the data analysis that I've done. I haven't. Yeah, we don't have a way to get at that right now. I have some ideas, but they may not be ideal for the instrument that we're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> well, no, so it's a really interesting question. Um, so, for example, like, who is the understory? Are they understory trees, or are they young individuals that will be canopy trees? And so, yeah, how does that affect the future of the forest? And so, there's a paper that I need to read that basically, I think it says that in Amazon forests, they tend to be understory trees and not recruits. But yeah, I need to do some more research. The other way that we could get at it is that at least for the big trees, um, we don't have enough data for small trees, but for the big trees, if there was enough difference in the species composition along sections of the transects, then I could at least break up these seasonal um, patterns and see if there's a phenological, uh, sorry, oh my goodness, phylogenetic signal, thank you, to, um, uh, to the, you know, uh, the seasonal signal. That's an easier word to say, if that made sense. Yeah, so, so there's a way to get at it, but it, it, we're never going to be able to like, look at a section of the LIDAR data and be like, oh, that's that tree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, like, can you bin it so that maybe you're looking at the surface level in a mature tree that's 60 feet up versus, or 60 meters, uh, versus that surface level that's, like, really young and maybe get a different response to how that might change things. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. the same color band that mm -hmm. you showed. Yeah, so we did do that, um, but uh, it's diff we, we can't tell whether it's a young individual or, um, so, so remember this one, 
Um, so wait, what were you asking again? So canopy surface, that's this red line. So up here, that's high height and at the canopy surface. And then down here, this is a lower height at the canopy surface. But you know, we don't know whether that's a young individual. We don't know if it's um, a, an established tree, although in high light, that's probably unlikely because that's quite, you know, they tend to be kind of environments that quickly regenerate to be um, shade environments. Um, the other thing it could be, this is maybe harder at the surface, but certainly here, what I didn't explain is those could be lower down branches of these high trees. So yeah, there's a lot of questions in there. Maybe we could come up with some kind of like probabilities of who it is, but I don't think we, what do you we think, Scott? We might be able to do a higher spatially resolved thing in the future where mm -hmm. we break it up into small subplots. That could help us figure that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. And this will be the last question. And then yeah. we'll let you can take it across the hall. Um, no, I'm not. And um, whilst I work very closely with uh, local forest technicians who live right close to the forest, and I love talking to them, and they know so much about the forest, and I wish that I could include what they know, because, yeah, they know so much, and they notice so many things about the forest that I, looking for different things as a researcher and not spending that much time there, just don't appreciate. Um, but, yeah, I don't know much about that. It would be really cool to include that. So if you know of anything, I'd love to read some on that. Yeah, no, well, please, you have to give me the citations. It'd be very cool to include. Well, thank you so much for coming. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And if you have any other questions, I think we're... <laughs>